All right, good morning, everyone. We'll get going here. If you're following along in the Etz Chaim Chumash, we're on page 649. We are beginning Parsha Tazria, and it begins, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the Israelite people thus, when a woman at childbirth bears a male, she shall be impure seven days. She shall be impure as at the time of her menstrual infirmity. On the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. She shall remain in a state of blood purification. For 33 days, she shall not touch any consecrated thing, nor enter the sanctuary until her period of purification is completed. If she bears a female, she shall be impure two weeks, as at her menstruation, and she shall remain in a state of blood purification for 66 days. So there's a lot, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot to talk about here. And this text is uh, making a lot of assumptions that we sort of have to have to fill in. We have to fill in the, the blanks here. And sort of the first thing we have to ask is why is this coming up now? Why is this coming up in the book of Leviticus? Why is this coming up after the events of last week's? last week's Parsha, Parsha Shmini. If you recall, Parsha Shmini sees the dedication of the tabernacle and the dedication of Aaron and his sons as priests. We have this apparently tragic incident with Nadav and Avihu who offer strange fire and they uh, are killed. And then we go on little inexplicably to a conversation about kashrut about which animals are and aren't permitted for uh for our consumption and now we're here now we move to this conversation about childbirth and so it would seem that this is um this is largely along the same lines as what we saw last week in the in the conversation about kashrut, why is it there? Why is it here? Well, it's because these are things you need to do. These are things you need to know how to do in order to maintain purity for the sake of the mishkan, for the sake of going into the tabernacle, going into the presence of God. So. These are not necessarily instructions for daily life. These are not instructions for your life, for my life. These are instructions for people who need to live by a high standard of holiness and a high standard of purity because they are capable, theoretically at least, of entering into the presence of God. And so then the question becomes, what do we do with that? Where do we take that, those of us living, uh, whether by choice, whether by circumstance, living in a post-temple reality, as we have been for the past 2,000 years, if keeping kosher is a matter of maintaining purity so that you can go on the temple, go on the temple mount, well, none of us really have to worry about that, right? Does that mean we don't have to keep kosher anymore? You could have taken it in that direction. You could imagine a scenario where the rabbis do take it in that direction. You don't need to worry about this stuff anymore. You don't need to worry about ritual purity. Because the big driver of our ritual purity is no longer relevant in our lives. But in fact, the rabbis take it in the opposite direction sometimes i want to be very careful with this sometimes there are some aspects of purity and impurity as described in the torah that we don't really worry about anymore i don't really worry about it when i go into a building that might have a dead body in it when I go to the hospital, for instance, it doesn't cross my mind 
oh, I've just made myself ritually impure. Maybe it'd be a different story if I were a Cohen. I don't know. But for me, I don't worry about it. And I don't feel like I have to worry about it. But when it comes to keeping kosher, I do worry about that. That does concern me. When it comes to washing our hands before we eat bread, this is actually an area where the purity of the temple ritual gets expanded after the destruction of the temple. And so what used to concern only the Kohanim now concerns all of us. And there's an argument to be made that at least some of the texts that refer to Kashrut move in that same direction. They may have been primarily interested in purity for temple worship purposes, but they get expanded. They get understood more expansively, and they become about the way we all live our lives. Other restrictions around animals don't. They get set aside. We don't really worry about, am I wearing a leather watch where the wristband is made out of an impure animal? I mean, I don't do that, but some people they'll have like a watch or boots or something like that made out of uh, made out of alligator skin, or you throw around the football. Footballs are no longer made out of pig skin, but they used to be, and we don't worry about that. Even though it says very clearly in the text, you're not supposed to touch these animals. If you do, you become impure, and we say, "Well, we're we're impure. That's just how it is." Um, it, but it's not something that we worry about. But kashrut, on the other hand, it is something we worry about. And the distinctions, much as I can offer you the various arguments for why we make these distinctions, um, I'll also be the first to acknowledge that on a, on, a, on a simple textual level, which of these we worry about and which of these we don't worry about feels a little arbitrary. And I don't think there's any getting around that. I think anytime you have a, a human society, a human society has to make choices, has to make choices around what is going to be taboo, what is going to be permissible. And ultimately those choices, though grounded in tradition, grounded in text perhaps, they aren't necessarily the sort of thing that feel inevitable. But we are recipients of a received tradition going back dozens and dozens of generations. All right, I'd love to hear other people's thoughts about what, uh, what we're talking about here. Anyone have any, anything to, to say, anything to add, questions, concerns? You wanna tell me I'm wrong? I'd love to hear it. No, but actually that's interesting about how certain of the rules continued or got expanded on and others didn't. Cause I was reading along yesterday in English and there was that part like, was it like if a, a, a dead bug falls in, I think it's like if a dead, you know, fruit fly fall, or fruit fly falls into my, cup of mug of tea do i have to smash that mug you know right. the dead creepy crawly thing got into it because i'm thinking i never heard that we had to do that before right no yeah yeah that actually came up in i my never thought about day. it but i was reading it yesterday it's like oh wow <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's uh it's 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 interesting and it's um like I say, it, it, it can feel a little arbitrary, and I don't know that there's a way to not make it feel arbitrary. I guess the only way to not make it feel arbitrary would be to say that we still live by all of these things in a very literal sense. And we're, we're you know, if there's some doubt, you fall on the side of doing it no matter what and removing all doubt. But, um, you know, in, in, in many ways, that would not be a, um, a functional society. I mean, what, what, what's being described here is a very um, you know, minutely detailed set of restrictions and regulations. And um, it, would be, it, would, it, it would be it would be very hard. It would be very hard to, 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 to live this uh, in, um, in, in, in the most literal sense, uh, which isn't to say some people haven't tried. But uh, <coughs> all right, to bring it back to the um, to a closer reading of the text itself. Uh, are there any other any other thoughts? Any other? Any well, I was just going to gonna say, post please, temple please. Uh, destruction of the temple, it, we had a choice to make, and the the rabbis that ended up making those choices 
decided that we were going to treat ourselves in many respects as the priests in, in, you know, infinitely towards the future, towards a time either when the temple would be rebuilt or just a whole transformational sense of, of who we are, what Judaism is. And Judaism isn't in the temple anymore. Um, for many people at that time, it wasn't in the temple either. You know, if you lived mm-hmm. in Alexandria or you lived in, in, in Babylon. And so the notion that you could carry Judaism with you, in a sense, was still was, was the original purpose of Judaism. I mean, if you think about literally Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai didn't talk about a temple, didn't even talk about a Mishkan. It just talk about what it is to be Jewish. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think there are, you know, there, there, there are sort of two ways that you can, you can look at that move. Um, one is to say that, you know, this, this transformation is a transformation and it's being done for the sake of memory. It's being done, you know, so that we remember the temple, so that we remember the rituals of, uh, of the Kohanim in the temple. We make them applicable in a wider sense now that the temple has been destroyed. And there's another way of reading it where you say that the, the rituals of the temple point to something broader, point to something more universal, more applicable, that's sort of always there. It's always a, a hidden layer in the text that was um, you know, supposed to be discovered. And so this is the, the timeless truth. That, you know, when it says the priests should wash their hands before sacrifice, it's a timeless truth that we should all learn from that to wash our hands before we eat a meal. Um, now, which of those you want to say is going to kind of depend on your, on your theology, depend on what you, uh, what you think is happening with the text. Um, most of the time, interestingly, the, when the Talmud speaks about these things, it does use memory as, um, as, as an explicit justification to say, you know, we do this in remembrance of the temple. So we have knowingly, consciously expanded past the plain, obvious meaning of the text in a way that wasn't inevitable. It wasn't necessarily implied by the text itself, but we have chosen to do that um, as as our way of of, of remembering um, the past and remembering these historic circumstances. this could be a whole class, but it's interesting to sort of take that um, into the future to say, what else can we consciously remember? What other changes, additions, subtractions, what else could we be doing with Jewish ritual to be more mindful of the, um, of the past, which is uh, often, often so, so lost to us as one generation moves into the next? Um, and, and, and this, uh, in some way, appears to be the charge of rabbinic Judaism to, to figure out how to do that. And um, it's, uh, it's an interesting question. We don't, we, 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 I, I could allow myself to very easily be distracted by this question. Um, but I want to I wanna, I wanna bring it back to the text. But all of this is sort of in the background as we try to figure out what um, what this text in front of us means, and, and, and specifically what it what it means for us, um, because this is one of the ones that um, people go, oh, okay, fine, I guess we came to this week. Okay, um, you know, I when when um, when 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 I was scheduling um, B'nai Mitzvah back in the day, um, uh, I was uh, I worked in the in the front office of a synagogue. That was my that was my first Jewish job. Uh, and I was doing all the bar and bat mitzvah scheduling and um, people would ask not to get this week. They would, they would say, can we, can we not get Tazria? Can we not get Mitzora? Um Because um, there was and is still kind of a, 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 a taboo uh, even, even to discuss these things. And certainly among uh, you know, the 12 and 13 year olds, um, there, there was a sense that this might not be the sort of thing that they wanted to uh, give a Devar Torah about uh, in front of all their friends. Uh, but um, here it is, you know, it's, it's, worth, uh, it's worth discussing, it's worth this conversation. And so, um, you know, to, to, to bring it back to the text here. So there appears to be, at least in the past, there appears to be this, uh, this concern about 
a, uh, a woman entering a state of impurity connected to having a child, connected to giving birth to a child. And there is a, um, a sort of, a, a, I don't want to say this. It's like there are degrees. There are degrees of, um, of, of, of purity and impurity. Um, and the, um, the, the new mother goes through this, um, this, this, the, this process to, um, to come back into a state of purity. And so the question that we have to ask is, you know, like, first of all, what does that mean? Is that, I always, I always have to ask this question, is this a good translation of the Hebrew? And the, um, you know, some people say it's not. Some people say this is a terrible translation, and the Hebrew can't even be expressed in English. So they use the term tahor and tameh, which we might translate as pure and impure. That's, that's the, what, what's being done here. And they say that's not a good translation at all of these concepts. Tahor and tameh are not about some sort of, you know, cooties, ick factor. It can't really be described in English. You know, to say a woman is Tame after she gives birth to a child, um, it implies that there's something, there's something wrong. There's something gross. There's something disgusting. Um, and that's not, in fact, what the word Tame means. Um, and, and, and people often point to the fact that a Torah scroll is Tame. If you touch a Torah scroll, you are Tame. You are what you might call impure. Um, and, 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 and so the question is, you know, what is this state? What is this status that a person gains? Um, I've, I've, seen it, uh, I've, I've, I've seen it sometimes um, people try to get uh, to, to approach it by saying it's about auspiciousness. It's about that feeling of... Um, it's sort of like a, it's like, it's like a humming background noise of holiness. And it requires the, 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 the rituals of the temple and the tabernacle require this baseline of extreme holiness. And so it's not about, you know, what is, um, you know, what, what is disturbing to us or disgusting to us or uh, it, it, anything like that, which, which frankly is, um, I mean, it's insulting to, to women, it's insulting to people who give birth to children to, 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 to think of it in those terms. Um, and, uh, and, and they say, well, that's not the point, though. That's not the point. Now, by the way, I, I should put on my, my sociologist hat and say that there's definitely another argument that it is, in fact, the point that um, ancient cultures have taboos around children, around childbirth. Um, around everything related to reproduction, and specifically the female reproductive system, that uh, this is just, these are features of ancient cultures. And you, you see this, and um, you just kind of, you know, it, 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 is, it is what it is. From our point of view, trying to live this text in the year 2022, we're not capable of saying, well, it is what it is. Um, I mean, we, we have to engage with this, and we have to say, what does this mean? What could this mean? So. Rabbi? Oh, please, go ahead. If I, okay. Um, talk about different hats. So, uh, again, you, you know, everybody has heard this. Um, what I'm going to mention is that sometimes it may just purely be prosaic as a uh, retired public health nurse and as a nurse. Um, again, the Torah is not, it's an instructional vehicle for the, you know, for a life, for, for how to live a life in holiness and in health. So purely prosaically, practically, um, th these are the underpinnings of how do you maintain generation to generation? You, you have to pay attention and, and centuries before this, people were paying attention or else people probably wouldn't have survived as successfully as they had um, to health matters and to cause and effect. And even though they didn't know the you know, exact cause and effect, I mean, we didn't know a lot of things about germ theory until like the you know, middle, late 1800s. So you know, it, it takes time, but you, you have a whole body of health knowledge um, for civilizations for out of, from the Egyptian legacy, from Babylonian um, to maintain health. So if, if a 
fruit fly falls into your cup and there's t dead carcasses, people did notice. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb. They did notice these things. They, they could notice sometimes that this happened to, to you know, Yitzhak or something when that once, you know, that happened. I mean, that he got sick or she got sick or in menstruation, it is yucky. I mean, being a woman, I, I mean, this is, these are, people don't like to discuss health matters, especially when it comes to gynecological and reproductive stuff, you know, all the, all the fluids and the yuck and the guck, you know, that's why some people are in medicine and some people say, no way, some people faint at the sight of blood. Right. So you have to have a stomach for it. And obviously, you know, people that were pastoral, uh, that were herders, they had a very intimate knowledge. You know, when you talk about Iowa, you know, you have this intimate knowledge of all this stuff, the practical, physical, physicality of our spiritual beings, you know, the housings are our are, are, are bodies. So it, it's in a practical sense too, but you have to wrap it in a whole package to sell the public health mes message. Look what's happening now. People can't just sell the public health message on public health on science. They, it, it, it's not computing. It doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense to people. They need something more, something more, um, a better package in order for them to grasp that it's significant. If you do this, if you wash your hands before eating, chances are you're going to, you know, reduce the, the germs on your skin and you're going to be healthier. So it's a, to say that it's purely um, on a spiritual religious realm, I think leaves out the whole picture that people were trying to inculcate or in, in, in train and grain for us human beings to live healthfully and holy as well. That it's a holy way to respect the body, to understand the processes of the body and to couch it as saying, this is the package from, from Hashem. And if you want to continue to be this package and participate in this package, this is what you got to do. That's my take on it. Yeah, thank thank you for sharing. That's um, so. So what Wendy is describing here is um, th th this is this has been part of the conversation um, uh, for the past couple hundred years at yeah. least. This yeah. was um, especially in the er the early reform rabbis in in Germany would um, would would point to the holiness code. Um, uh, and, and specifically, you know, the, 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 the rituals of purity and impurity is described in the book of Leviticus um, as an ancient health code. Uh, and, um, and, 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 and certainly, um, when we look at it, there appears to be a lot of, um, a lot, a lot of overlap with, um, with, with uh, sort of a primitive sense of health regulations. Don't go into a room where there is a dead body. If you do, you're going to be impure. Maybe don't spend too much time in there. That seems reasonable from a health code perspective. Um, or, um, you know, this is uh, when, when, uh, when my youngest was born um, at Northwestern Hospital in Chicago. Um, I, was, <laughs> I, I was handed a pamphlet um, by one of the nurses that, um, that basically said, um, don't, don't sleep with your wife. Um, she just had a baby. <laughs> Don't have sex with your wife. Um, and um, I was like, "Oh, thank you, thank you for this." And um, and there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of detail in it from uh, from a medical perspective about um, about how uh, a woman who just just gave birth she needs to heal up. She she should not be having sexual relations. Um, and and certainly um, you can read this bit here as uh, as as saying the same thing. Um, they they didn't have you know a, a health code or a consciousness of science, so they use language of purity and impurity. And if if what we gain from this text here is um, is is a sense that um, that 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 men um, I'm, I'm speaking heteronormatively here, but that that, that men are going to uh, to not, to not push their wives who just gave birth into having sex too soon after after childbirth. Um, there is some human benefit to that. There's some social benefit to that, a health benefit. Um, that is that is definitely true. Um, I'm a little more sympathetic to the health code argument than um, than some other conservative rabbis. 
but um, but 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 we are, we are taught to uh, to to sort of push back on that. Um, that um, that be, for for one very practical reason, which is that once you say that the book of Leviticus is an ancient health code, then um, then it becomes very easy to say, and we obviously know better. We 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 have better science. We have better information. So you don't really have to worry about these things anymore. It's interesting. It's um, it's informative to look at the the way the ancients thought, and um, and we have refrigeration, so you don't have to worry about trichinosis. Go ahead and eat whatever you want. That's the worry. That's the worry that people are going to take it in that way, um, and, um, and and plenty of people have taken it that way. Um, this you know this this was a uh, this is a, a, a sort of classic position in um, in in Reform Judaism. Um, um, Isaac Mayer Wise, who um, uh, founded Hebrew Union College, he um, he, he would speak about uh, about this issue uh, quite a bit. Um, and um, so, you know, I'm I'm sympathetic to both the, to both points of view. I, I think there are good reasons to observe the meets vote, even in a world where we don't have to worry about you know these sort of health concerns in quite the same way. Um, but this is a great example of a health concern that is still relevant because the reason they handed me that pamphlet at the hospital is clearly because there are men who are pushing their wives um, for sex too soon after they uh, after they give birth. This is uh, this is still still an issue in some uh, in some circles. Um, and this this was a this was a very clever way um, to to get the health message across to to wrap it in. Um, in the in in the world of purity and taboo and to um and to make it a command from god so it's a uh, it's an interesting conversation um uh, and there's um you know we're we're not we're not going to settle the debate uh but i just want to i just want to present to you that this is this is a hotly debated issue among the different uh the different perspectives the different denominations in judaism but, but that's the beauty of okay you know bring it up to 2022 the the beauty of this is that we can approach this and either you know follow it as as fundamentalistly as we would like you know every um everything it's you can say that yes do we have an individual choice that's a whole other discussion as well you know whether that's allowed or not but basically one does not necessarily preclude the other again like you you mentioned or other you know people say well i I do this, you know, I, I, I keep kosher, but I don't do this. Um, I don't smash every vessel that a fruit fly jo drops into. Um, or you can say, I'm going to do, I'm going to do the whole, I'm going to do everything as best as I can, you know, cross every T and dot every I as close to the, to the book, to the words as best as I can. And, but one doesn't preclude the other. I, I guess it doesn't, precluded to me, but that's, you know, an assumption um, to say that what is the, what is the difference between if I was a Haredi um, Orthodox Jewish person versus if I was a reform or conservative or anywhere in between all of the, the variations on the, on the interpretation and the practice. So again, um, you know, are we a strict constitutionalist? <laughs> or is there is there some latitude, and has there been that way throughout the generations anyway, with revisions and additions and subtractions in the writing of Torah to begin with? But um, I, I don't think it's I don't think it has to be an adversarial um, position at all. I, I really don't. I think it, an individual or a group of individuals that come together as a synagogue or um, you know they say everybody who wants to be part of this has to do this and to the best of your ability. So I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't yeah, know. No, I, 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 think that's a, I think that's a great point. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, I think there are, um, there's definitely room for someone to read this text and say, well, this was something of an ancient health code and it's not necessarily, you know, entirely relevant in modern times as a health code, but this is something that we've been doing for dozens of generations. And this is, this is what it is to be part of the covenant is to do these things. And 
um, to sort of look at it, uh, at it in, in terms of normative practice, where you say, I don't necessarily feel compelled to do this by, um, by the text itself, but I feel compelled by the fact that Jews have been doing this um, for thousands of years. And, and, and the, the community of people that I aspire to be a part of largely do this also. And so to be a part of the community, uh, to be a, a, a part of, of this collective means to, um, mean, means to do these things that we've, we've been doing and to, to do them the, the way we've been doing them more or less um, for, for, you know, for, for the past great many generations. Yeah, you don't have to rewrite it. It's there. You can, you can do it. You can follow it. So. Right, and then you right. interpret how to follow it, though. That's sometimes. Absolutely. Thing. Absolutely. Yeah, that was, um, you know, that, that, that was more or less the position of Mordecai Kaplan, the founder of the, the Reconstructionist movement, that these, these practices, he called them folkways. He said that this is, this is just in a, in a descriptive sense what it is to be a Jew who participates in the life of Judaism is to be a Jew who keeps meets vote. And it doesn't mean that there's a God who's gonna throw lightning bolts at you if you don't do it. But to be American is to have a turkey at Thanksgiving and to be Jewish is to do these things. It's just sort of a descriptive reality of, uh, of, 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 of what, a, uh, what a thick culture provides for, um, for individuals who aspire to be part of something, something bigger and greater than themselves. All right, so this is this is a lot of great conversation. I love this conversation. I do want to I do want to bring it into the um, the text itself. I want to look a, a little a little closer here. So we'll we'll jump back here to verse two. Um, Speak to the Israelite people thus: When a woman at childbirth bears a male, she shall be impure seven days. She shall be impure as at the time of her menstrual infirmity. Um, not probably how I would translate it. That's okay. Um, on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Now, obviously, we're talking about um, the, the boy that she, um, she's just given birth to. Um, and you might think that this is, not, um, this is not necessary. We know this already. We already know to circumcise boys on the eighth day. Um, so why, why is it coming here? Why are we getting this here? And, um, and the rabbis say, actually, that's not, that's not at all true, that it is not, um, strictly speaking, it is, it is not possible to derive the, um, the mitzvah of uh, a brit milah, of circumcision, from the story of Abraham. That the story of Abraham is a story of, uh, of, of God um, having this specific relationship with this specific man and his descendants, and it is um, it is different from the covenant of Torah, and so the 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 Torah itself, which is to say the text, the instructions given to Moses, needs to contain some reference to circumcision, because otherwise you would read the text and say, okay, so this thing that God told Abraham, I'm not sure that applies to us anymore. Um, and in fact, the rabbis say that um, the, uh, the, 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 way, the, way you, the way you can know that it doesn't apply to um, the, 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 the specific mitzvah given to Abraham doesn't apply to us is that it has to be given again. It has to be given again here. And so obviously there's a connection. Obviously there's a deep spiritual connection. When we speak, you know, when I'm at a, uh, at, at a bris and I'm, I'm speaking, I will talk about Abraham. Every rabbi talks about Abraham. Um, uh, but, uh, but strictly speaking, what's going on with Abraham is not Torah. It is not the 613 meets vote. And in fact, um, there's, there, there's, there's really no implication in the text itself that Abraham um, keeps the 613 meets vote that he knows about them that he bears the status of Jewish this is uh this is uh, you know he's not quite Jewish he's not quite a Gentile he's somewhere in between um and um as, as far as the rabbis and the Gemara are concerned uh Abraham is 
a righteous Gentile who keeps the seven commandments of Noah, keeps this additional commandment of circumcision uh, because he has been instructed about it, and keeps the other mitzvot um, instinctively. The, uh, the way the text describes it is that his kidneys have this function of telling him what to do and what not to do. And so he doesn't know, I'm just saying, for instance, he doesn't know not to, not to eat pork, but maybe, you know, he sees some, someone offers it to him, um, and his kidneys start to tell him, they, they start to ache, they start to feel bad, um, and, he, um, and he knows not to do it. Uh, we, we, we speak of this in English, we say, you know, I feel it in my gut, or something like that. Um, and it's, it's, the same, it's the same sort of intuitive sense. And so Abraham, um, uh, the, 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 the mitzvah given to him doesn't necessarily apply. And we see that in the text itself, that <coughs> by the time you get to the, um, the sojourn in Egypt, that men have stopped circumcising. And in fact, Moses very famously doesn't circumcise his son and is chased by some sort of um, angel or creature. It, 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 it's unclear what's going on in that, in that text. It seems like Moses is being chased by God in some, in some, in some sense, who's coming, who's, coming to, um, who's coming to give Moses a bad time. Uh, we'll put it that way. And in, later in the book of Joshua, when the Jewish people are about to cross the Jordan River, <coughs> enter into the land of Israel, there is a mass circumcision that happens on a hill. All the men circumcise themselves. And the hill after that is called the Hill of Foreskins. So I'm not, I'm not making this up. This is in the book of Joshua. But um, we see here... <coughs> This instruction is sort of it's sort of added in, honestly, in a way that doesn't doesn't really flow. It doesn't really make sense on a textual level. We're um, we're told here about the status of the mom. This is about this is about women. This is about what happens when a woman gives birth, and we sort of go through the calendar after she has given birth, and. <coughs> You know, to the um, to the extent that this uh, this makes sense as an insertion, where now we're not talking about the mom. Now we've switched subjects, and now we're talking about her son. It it only makes sense to the extent that it fits on the calendar, and um, and we see that the eighth day um, not only becomes the day of circumcision, it becomes the day when she ends her seven day period of initial. Um, uh, impurity or, or, or tame status, we, we call it in Hebrew. And so it's, uh, it's seven days in which she is in a, uh, a state of ritual impurity. And then on the eighth day, she enters into a, um, a, a state that's a, a, little, uh, a, a, li a little less extreme. Um, it's, it's described here as Bidme Tahara, um, the state of blood purification. Um, for 33 days. Now, the question you could ask is, is this 33 um, days after the seven days, or is it after the eighth day? Um, we won't get into that, but um, it's, it's a little unclear in the text itself. <coughs> Pardon me. I, I think it's implied, by the way, that it's, it's seven plus 33, which gets you the nice, nice round number of, uh, of 40. And then interestingly, um, it's 66 if she has a girl. So she remains in this state of purification uh, where she shouldn't enter the tabernacle or enter into uh, the, the holy places <coughs> for 66 days when she has a girl. Now, the text offers zero explanation of the distinction here, why, why a girl has a longer state of purification than a boy. Uh, as you can imagine, there are um, a lot of different points of view 
from uh, from the rabbis about why this uh, why this ought to be. Um, if I remember, yeah, the uh, the Etz Chaim um, doesn't really get into it. The Etz Chaim doesn't really say. Um, there, there, there is an Etz Chaim. Yeah, there's a footnote, um, a couple of foot, footnotes uh, speculating about that um, as well. <clears throat> um, part of it is the, um, as, as far as the extension of it, um, let's see. Uh, let's see, um, maybe, in, let's see, purity after giving is doubled, who will herself, is it, you know, is it um, because the, child because the the female is also um who will herself contain the divine gift of nurturing and giving birth to a new life because she will also be a vehicle for that or is it the normal period two weeks only to be reduced after the birth of a son to allow the mother to attend the breed in a state of ritual purity or because breed mila on the eighth day is a purifying rite um there, there is some speculation and also the um the health of the child, like the Brit Mila can be postponed only in consideration of the health of the child. Um, I mean, I guess, I mean, right, there's there's no real way to understand why exactly. Um, another interesting thing that they mention is the, um, the woman um, sometimes would curse and say, I'm never going through that again. I'm not gonna, that, that was so much pain, I'm not gonna do it again. And she makes a an, an indiscretionary vow, and the Talmud speculates that some women, because of the pain of childbirth, may have vowed to abstain from further sexual relations to avoid such pain. The offering, the burnt offering, is part of the process that releases her from the rash vow. And also, as a dove, it's mentioned something about as a dove returns to its roost. In other words, this whole process is very animalistic, and so the spiritual nature of women in this whole process is a away from the spiritual higher plane it's more on that you know so you, you need this space between getting through all of this the, the yucky part <laughs> the <laughs> physical the physical part in order to be restored in good graces to be resuming your spiritual role and being acceptable to take on and be part of that spiritual community it said it says it here somewhere i can't Kind of right yeah yeah I, I i think you know the the the, the way so the, the 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 way that the text um is traditionally read um where you know the etz chaim's being a little a little careful by just um the you know the, the 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 comment here the number two it's it's a lot of questions right everything's a question mark um uh, and they're and they're saying well we don't we don't we don't know actually um and there definitely is a way to read this text where it's you know a bunch of um a, a, a bunch of basically cavemen who are saying like ew women gross periods gross um i mean there there is you know that and and and, and that's certainly part of human uh, the human experience is that there are there are there are men there are patriarchal cultures um where this um you know what, what women's reproductive system ends up um, being the thing of, of uh, you know, to, to, to be cast aside or set into a, the, you know, the red tent and all this sort of stuff. Um, but that's not actually the, 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 I think, the best and most uh, most obvious reading of, uh, of the text. Like, like you mentioned, Wendy, um, the, the fact that it's a, a longer period of, um, uh, of impurity or, uh, or, or, or purification, rather, um, to, to give birth to a girl. I, I think it does imply, like you say, that there is something um, there, there, there's, there's something you know, sort of holy and sacred and auspicious and uh, worthy of reverence um, in in the the, the female life bearing impulse um, and and this this capacity of women to to give birth to a child um, in the ancient world. It was understood with, uh, with 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 a little bit of, of, of terror and absolute reverence by um, by by the, the the men 
who had no scientific explanation of what uh, of what was uh, what was going on here. Um, they but they they simply knew that um, that that women appear to have a, a power um, nearly magical. I mean, what on earth? How does that happen? <laughs> Where she creates a new life, um, gives birth to a new life. It's um, it, it's it's it, it's it's amazing. Um, and, and, and it remains amazing, even for those of us who have more of a more of a scientific basis of understanding of what's uh, of what's going on here. And so this is about um, this is about honoring that. And at the same time, um, it's about a um, the, the, the sort of um, the terror that comes with the close proximity of life and death that. Um, you know, giving birth was not a risk-free proposition. Um, it remains. Um, you know, there there are still women who die Absolutely. in childbirth. It's you know, it's Absolutely. awful. Um, Absolutely. Oh, please go ahead. No, no, I'm I'm just I'm just agreeing. It's it's you know, the, um, right that the whole the whole process is can be terrifying, and and it and it and it and like you said, it still is, and and many and many a husband has probably you know, fainted <laughs> in, in the labor room because uh, oh, yeah. oh, it's, yeah. it's, still, it's still hard. It's and, and, and many a woman, many, many. Awesome. Yeah. 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 It's, um, it's, you know, it's um, you can see in other texts in the, in the Tanakh, the, uh, it, it doesn't say this, but it basically implies that, um, that, that, that in, 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 in that society, when, uh, when women would give birth, the men, would uh, would make a point of not even being around. They they wouldn't be nearby, um, and and they would they would have to be told that a baby was born through a through a messenger. Um, now I'm I'm not I'm not saying that we ought to do that, but um, that uh, that that appears to to be the way it was done back then. Um, and you know until quite recently, it was in 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 our culture in our society. You know men stayed out in the in the waiting room um and uh you know like watch, watch any watch any old movie um and and you see the men are pacing in the in the in the waiting room while the women are in the delivery room um the sort of intersection here like you say of the of of, of the, the the you know the icky stuff the the the, you know, the the liquids the blood um it's it you know the there there's a great interest in 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 the ancient world in blood and specifically you know here and um you know the the way the way it it all sort of intersects and you know it she becomes it, it, it describes it as uh it's translated here as uh as as a period of blood purification um, and and that's bidme um, tahara is is what what it is in in Hebrew, and that is um, that, that's a pretty that's a pretty good translation. Um, it, it it's in in this moment it's all about the blood. The blood is the uh, the the bearer of life, and at the same time, when the blood's pouring out of you, it's often a a, a symbol of death. It's a symbol that you're about to die, um, and so. We see here this intersection of life and death um, in the in the act of childbirth, in the recovery period, and in the Brit Milah also. When the when when the you know a, a boy who's just born, he's eight days old, barely barely born, um, and um, you know we have an impulse to protect that child. We have an impulse to care for that child. It is the most natural thing in the world to want to do everything you can to keep that child enormously safe. Um, some, you know, some, some, some people today, you go visit them, they got a baby, you, you have to like wash yourself in Purell. I mean, this is even before COVID. Um, there, you know, people, people have this enormous impulse to, to stay um, as safe and healthy and keep the baby as healthy as possible. And then we're told on the eighth day, you need to cut a part of his body off. You need to remove a part of his body, um, and 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 you need to um, you you need to cut him with uh, with a knife and make him bleed, and um, and the, the 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 blood is actually like the the important part of what's happening there. Removing the foreskin is important, but actually the the halakha is that if you remove the foreskin in a way that doesn't allow any bleeding, you have not done um, halachic uh, circumcision. Uh, and 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 so there are a number of new methods with clamps and this sort of thing that actually can't be uh, can't be used 
um, by by a moil, or it, it's a point of great debate. I'll put it that way. Um, and, it, and so there's this intersection of blood as a symbol of life and a symbol of death at the same time. And and a, you know the 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 bleeding out was often a a common cause of the of death. And you, you know you 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 lose you, potentially you could lo lose a lot of blood. Um, I believe I think I believe I needed. I can't remember for sure if it, it's a slight transfusion. I mean, your hemoglobin drops can drop way down. Oh, so, sure. and, it, and it takes time for the blood, you know, the red blood cells to regenerate. I mean, it's, uh, you know, um, they average about 120 days. So that's, um, you know, to, to, to build up, to eat your iron rich food and to right, get your right. back and uh, produce your back to where you were. Yeah, yeah, and then suddenly you're also you're also nursing a child. It's uh, the demands exactly. exactly. There's a lot. There's a lot of resource competition going on. So um, because I I, I want to we got a few minutes left. And I do want to hit this next bit here, um, which uh, which Wendy already mentioned um, about the offering of the uh, of the sacrifice. It says on the completion of the period of purification for either son or daughter. She shall bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a lamb in his first year for a burnt offering, a pigeon or a turtle dove for a purification offering. So um, women, after they have a child, they need to bring a chatat, which is normally uh, is translated here as purification offering. You also see it sometimes translated as sin offering. And so the question is, what is what is the sin? What is what? What does she need to be purified of? Um, is this saying that there's something um, there's something kind of bad or wrong about having babies? And 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 the rabbis say, oh no, God forbid, you should not read it that way. Um, sometimes you bring a chatat to exit a state of um of ritual impurity and enter into a state of, of ritual purity um not because you did anything wrong not because there's a sin involved um but simply because this is a way of uh, of, of recognizing the auspiciousness of the moment of recognizing that um that that, that, that you were in in some way a um a vessel of the divine you uh, you you were involved in this um, in this 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 life giving moment, this hugely consequential um, spiritual moment that um, you know it, it it doesn't it doesn't happen very often in life. Um, these are you know there are a lot of days we probably don't remember all that well. Um, these don't don't tend to be the those. I mean these are days that uh, that everyone remembers. Uh, I, I certainly do, and I was I was just I was just you know standing there. Um, but um, you know the, the 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 ritual of the sacrifice isn't about having having committed some transgression. It's about re-entering the the normal world, the everyday world. Um, and there are some readings that say you know maybe she made a vow or something like this, um, which is fine. Those are fine enough readings. Um, but um, I, I, I think you don't need to take it in that direction. I think it's about a re-entry into the everyday, the non-auspicious, the sort of mundane reality of life where you're going to have, you're going to go to work and you're going to go home and you're going to have the days that, uh, that don't make a lasting impact. Um, and and, and that's, that's how it's supposed to be, but it's a way of, of separating um, those boundaries, much as the uh, offering um, the sin offering, the, the, the chatat given by the Nazarite at the end of his vow, when he can cut his hair and go drink alcohol, um, it, it, it doesn't mean the Nazarite did anything wrong. It doesn't mean that he sinned by becoming a Nazarite. It just means that the chatat allows you to move from one um, auspicious moment to uh, more of an everyday moment. All right. Any thoughts about that? Questions, comments, concerns? I think that um, it's, a, it's just a really good way to explain it because, uh, especially around the moment of birth, um, uh, for anybody who's been through it, you just cannot believe how you sit on the cusp of life and death like that. It it was just such a 
amazing but shocking, horrible and amazing thing all at once. And and uh, I don't think that's changed over the ages, and I don't think it ever will. I mean, a lot of the health or medical abilities uh, do come into play, but I, it, it just made so much more sense to me. Uh, the, the, these these words made so much more sense to me that, uh, after having gone through it, and um, yeah, I think it's highly relevant. I, I, and the, the you can't you you don't get over it in fifteen minutes. You know, you don't get over it in a couple of weeks. It's uh, yes, there's part of you saying I never ever ever want to have to go through this again, and other people, you know, you, it's totally understandable. And to think about it in terms of just being in a different realm, you are absolutely it, just like on Shabbat, you're in a different realm, and and uh, it's such a great part of being human, and to have it codified in this way, and to learn that the words are not translated quite just like uh, korban makes so much more sense to me, you know, in that in that context. So I like the word auspicious too. That's good. Auspicious. Much better than I was like, because I've got the art scroll one here, and art scroll uses the word contaminated. It's actually <laughs> really good translations, but I'm like, contaminated. Okay. <laughs> That's even worse than impure. <laughs> right. Wow. That's like toxic. <laughs> uh, toxic waste dump. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yashikawa. Al Thanks for coming, everyone. Take care and have a great week. Shavuot Tov.